वेलकम टू डेली डिब्रीफ ब्रॉट यू बाय पीपल्स डिस्पैच आई एम प्रज्ञा अर्जेंटीना हैज वॉन द वर्ल्ड कप एंड लाइनल मेसी हैज नॉट रिटायर्ड फ्रॉम इंटरनेशनल फुटबॉल सेकेंड स्टोरी इसराइल्स डिपोटेशन ऑफ सलाह हमूरी द फ्रेंच पैलेस्टीनियन ह्यूमन राइट्स डिफेंडर हैज इन्वाइटेड वाइड स्प्रेड एंगर टूवर्ड्स इसराइल्स फोर्स ट्रांसफर पॉलिसी फॉर द ऑक्यूपाइड टेरिटरीज a warning from the united nations envoy in libya to put aside political differences elections in libya were put off last december and the stalemate has only grown stronger since then the fifa world cup is over with argentina's victory and lionel messi declared the king of the game and not ready to retire it was an unusual world cup much of it because it was held in qatar uh, sidhant ane who was in qatar joins us in the studio to discuss the legacy of this game great sidhant so you're back from uh, qatar pretty hectic uh, one month tell us about it what was the mood like as you were leaving uh, yeah. wow that's it I, i was prepared for like a, was this the final of all finals kind of question uh, but the mood when uh, we were leaving actually that's that's Uh, put us in a completely different zone because uh i suppose from a wider football perspective just the sport uh, something happened last night that was a bit special it's not in uh, the ordinary that two superstars uh, absolute like at the top level of their profession they never and also functioning at peak performance levels in in their own ways uh fire all their cylinders at the same time so in that sense it was rare and and overall this world cup threw up many rarities it was the first time an african team made it to the semi final uh we had conversations through the tournament about a range of political issues that otherwise at uh, tournaments like these are completely ignored absolutely because the same journalists who are covering it uh, there Suddenly, are not so interested in what's going on outside uh, the bubble, which is very comfortable and very well created. It uh, allows for journalists to enter into it and then remain within it quite comfortably, uh, filing your stories, writing your reports about the matches and what's happening on the pitch, and maybe some other conversations you're having around it. But all centered on the World Cup, nothing to do with the place you're in, uh, the people that actually live and inhabit that space. uh what are the challenges that they might face how do these events impact them if at all uh, those those are some of the reasons i would imagine that the world's press uh, goes to these events not just to watch the games which which was great in itself and super well organized and all of that so so it kind of throws you off right because you're spending the first couple of weeks of the tournament watching two games a day which means you're bi- pretty much on the road from let's say 9 in the morning or 8 in the morning to about uh, midnight or uh, after that so after th- then there's very little scope to think about oh uh, how do people actually live in this space which was otherwise a desert and suddenly now has all these buildings and stadiums and uh, an education city and museums and libraries and all of this right so who who is inhabiting it and and what are all of the so so uh, in that sense i guess the legacy of the world cup and the mood uh, in general for people who you leave behind who live there is also a bit iffy they are not sure what will happen some people like the regular uber drivers for example they are happy because for the duration of the world cup they introduced a new uh, service which allowed anyone with a private vehicle to put a sticker on their car and run it as a taxi okay so those not earning uh, regular incomes or high incomes started doing that many of them from our parts of the world indians nepalis uh, bangladeshis uh, pakistanis all dri- riding their private vehicles after hours to make an extra buck so they will be happy that things will normalize offices and schools will open so people will regular com- commuters will start commuting again uh it's been a, re- a really b- sort of bubble world cup uh, because you know the way the country is also governed uh, <laughs> it allows the state to give holidays when it chooses to and it chose this time and the final was on qatar's national day which they celebrated and, and all of that uh so uh yeah 
So, the Sudan, mood was iffy. The mood was iffy. <laughs> yeah. Sudan, what was the legacy in terms of, you know, who won, who couldn't win, who couldn't make it to the uh, final and also uh, Lionel Messi uh, sort of overshadows the entire team and we were discussing this earlier today. Uh, what happens to him next? Yeah, I think uh, by, by the looks of it, he carries on and, and I don't see any reason why the way Messi is playing today, uh, he can't do the same at 38 or 39. Uh, because in terms of, uh, of course, it requires performance at a certain level, but it's a sport that he understands at a level that is beyond most of us uh, mere mortals. And, and it requires some quite complex uh, computation from time to time because you have to uh, figure out the ball and also the dynamics of where the rest of your team is moving and the other team is moving. So there are a lot of moving parts essentially to figure out. Uh, so uh, Messi's legacy now is cemented. He's now uh, as Argentine as an Argentinian can be. And I think he has been for some time actually, Pragya. I don't know. A lot of the Western media, maybe uh, because what we read also what is written in English that comes from South America or Latin America. Uh, and so uh, we get taken in by their storylines, right? This divide between, it was the same in the case of Morocco, where so many of their players are born outside of the country, but are now representing the country. So 14, the, I think, yeah, out of 14 or, Yeah, yeah. Uh, the highest in the tournament. Amazing, you remember that. <laughs> you got quite into the World Cup, I have to say. <laughs> I did, I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, 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 the same kind of thing should apply, whether you're a big footballing nation from a traditional perspective or not, right? So, and just because Argentina is a big footballing nation from that perspective doesn't mean it has the richest clubs. And so, like, even Emiliano Martinez, the, the goalkeeper who's a bit also off his head, as all goalkeepers are, uh, was also saying that at the age of 12, you have to take that bus and head over to a place which is completely alien. Uh, just because that's the only way to perhaps have a career in this profession. And he spent a lot of time at Arsenal in London, which is a completely alien culture to uh, anywhere, small town, uh, Argentina, I would imagine. And to fit in, try and fit in with that and then move on from there, try and find another club. And, and he's only grown since then to uh, where he has come to now. So, so uh, I think Messi, yes, of course, he overshadows everything and it was all about him for, for the last three days, five days of the tournament. Also Maradona. All about him. Yeah, and, and, and that uh, correlation, which I think also people have moved beyond now because Maradona is no longer around. Uh, and so he's no longer such a physical uh, <laughs> experience, which is what he was. At, like, I remember in Brazil uh, at the World Cup when he would walk into a stadium, it didn't matter what was happening on the pitch. Absolutely. Yeah. Everyone <laughs> was turning around and taking pictures of that guy. So, so uh, yeah, so, so I think uh, Messi has now uh, transcended that and, and they figured out what the points of similarity are. Uh, this new aggro and this new uh, feel that uh, Messi is showing, uh, displaying uh, all of his emotions whenever they are called upon, is a side that's endearing him to a lot of people and I think he's won that voter base. Now, now it remains to be seen what they do with actually what the legacy that they built. Right. What they teach the next generation and how even things like uh, what clubs they choose to sign for, how they end their careers, all of these things, right? It would be uh, great for us if Messi stays on for another World Cup. But does that mean he will then start uh, playing club football at any random organization that pays him a big paycheck? And what does that do to your legacy then in, in that context? Yeah. All right, Sadhan, thanks for joining us. Salah Hamouri, a lawyer with Adamir, a human rights group that advocates justice for prisoners held in occupied Palestine, has been deported from Israel to France. He was held in so-called administrative detention in March. Hamouri has spent over a decade in Israeli prisons for opposing Israel's illegal occupation. Israel's constantly changing residency laws and revocation of so-called permits for Palestinians to live in the occupied territories are once again in focus. We go over to Abdul from People's Dispatch to discuss this. Hi, Abdul. 
Abdul, what is the basis on which he has been deported and what is the situation like in Israel? Well, uh, as per the claims made by the Israeli uh, Interior Ministry, uh, uh, Hamori has been uh, deported primarily because of his uh, disloyalty to the Israeli state uh, and, uh, after, uh, and his activities which they thought is a, a kind of terrorism, quote-unquote terrorist activities. Uh, he was, uh, before he was arrested in March, uh, his uh, res uh, residency uh, rights were uh, revoked uh, by the Israeli state in October 2021, um, claiming that uh, on the basis of his uh, quote unquote disloyalty. Uh, Israel annexed, uh, has uh, annexed uh, East uh, Jerusalem in 1980s, uh, and since then it has basically not given any right to the Palestinians living there. Uh, uh, they are only allowed to uh, reside in uh, the territory, they do not have right to vote and so on and so forth. But on the contrary, the Jewish uh, uh, citizens of uh, uh, East Jerusalem have the citizenship rights. So uh, there is dual kind of uh, uh, rules, for one for Palestinians and one for the uh, uh, Jewish uh, Israeli citizens. Uh, so uh, his deportation is is basically also based on the overall idea, uh, uh, overall understanding uh, in Israel that he has been involved in activities uh, which is uh, prohibited. Of course, uh, all the Palestinians who fight for the liberation of Palestine, who fight for the rights for Palestinians, uh, are considered to be acting against the Israeli state. And uh, that basically that becomes the basis uh, for uh, different kinds of treatment Palestinians go through. Uh, some of them are arrested, some of them are deported. And this, uh, this uh, deportation is basically a part of that larger uh, uh, process. Uh, as far as the, uh, the condition of uh, the Palestine is concerned, uh, we know that in last uh, uh, few uh, years, Though the Palestinians have always been uh, on the receiving end of the Israeli state, uh, Israeli state atrocities or colonial occupation uh, tactics, the rules, what it is uh, increasingly recognized as apartheid regime in the occupied territories, uh, uh, in last few uh, years, the, the oppression has increased many fold. And there are thousands of Palestinians in the uh, uh, Israeli prisons. Uh, hundreds of them have been killed in this year itself uh, for, for basically standing up for their basic rights of uh, uh, self-determination and uh, other human rights. Thanks, Abdul, for joining us. Libya is in a strange in-between zone. It has an internationally backed prime minister and a UN brokered ceasefire since 2020. The ceasefire hinges on holding a presidential and parliamentary election. But a year after missing the deadline, there is no sign of this election. Since Muammar Gaddafi was deposed and killed by NATO forces in 2011, conflict and violence has raged in the country. We'll go back to Abdul for some of the latest details. So, Abdul, what has delayed the election in Libya? See, initially last year, when the elections were about to conduct it, uh, there were disagreements over the electoral law. Uh, uh, the kind of the nature of those disagreements related to the constituencies, how do you decide the candidates, candidates candidacy and other things. Uh, apart from the electoral law, which was passed by the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, Libyan parliament, we should understand that uh, the, uh, Libya uh, is divided into two different uh, spheres. The, there is a Libyan parliament, which is uh, based in Tobruk, in the eastern part of Libya, and there is a uh, even quote-unquote recognized government based in uh, capital Tripoli. And they both have disagreements. Right. So, the UN-led peace negotiations tried to uh, reduce those disagreements, and uh, on that basis, the elections were proposed last year. But uh, the, uh, the institution which was assigned the job to pass the electoral law was the parliament. And whatever law the parliament passed, the, the, the government in Tripoli did not agree with it. So those disagreements led to the postponement of the elections in uh, uh, last year. Uh, 
Apart from that, there were also issues related to, for example, the candidacy of the pr uh, Prime Minister, the Bebas, right. uh, whether he should contest the presidential election or not. Uh, as per the agreement, even led agreement, when the uh, interim government was proposed, he was not supposed to uh, uh, contest the presidential election, but he did. Nonetheless, he became the uh, became one of the candidates, which became one of the reasons for the uh, uh, Tobruk-based parliament to object to the uh, entire process. Since then, uh, there were different attempts made uh, to conduct the elections uh, in last one year, but it has not materialized primarily because there has been no agreement yet on the. Uh, the pro electoral law. And despite the fact that the UN has intervened and there were talks in Cairo, there were talks in other places uh, between both the uh, parts, both parts, both the governments in Libya, uh, uh, but uh, it has not resulted in any kind of uh, uh, agreement. Okay, Abdul, can you also give us a context for the situation in Libya and a little bit on the significance of this election? Why is it so important to have this election? Uh, well, as you rightly pointed out, the, uh, the current uh, situation in Libya emerged uh, uh, after the NATO-led uh, intervention, invasion, whatever you call it, in 2011, uh, which basically deposed uh, the long-term uh, uh, ruler uh, Muammar Gaddafi. He was killed uh, in a mob violence. Um, and since then, Libya has uh, seen a kind of war. Uh, between the loyalists of uh, Qaddafi and those who wanted to establish a new kind of government backed by different foreign forces, whether it is UAE, there is US, other uh, countries have been involved in that war. Uh, in 2015, there was a new led initiative which led to some kind of agreement that also happened on December 24. Uh, at, uh, but that all that Agreement did not, did not materialize, though there was an election, uh, a new parliament was elected, uh, a government was formed, but the parliament and the government had disagreements over various issues. And since then, uh, 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 the war kind of re-emerged. Uh, 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 so for a very long time, till uh, 2019, there was an active, uh, 2020, sorry, there was a war uh, between different factions in Libya, and Libya is divided. Na, right now between three different uh, 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 groups, influential and three different parts. Eastern part, con the largest part, is controlled by the forces which used to be uh, loyal to Khalifa Haftar, a, a warlord. Uh, the western part is, co is controlled by, most of it, is controlled by the UN-backed government. And uh, there is a southern part which is controlled by different smaller tribal groups here and there. So the uh, the UN-led initiative, the Libyan uh, Political Dialogue Forum, which have finally was able to uh, create a ceasefire in 2020. And in 2021, March, uh, a new government, interim government was uh, established under the uh, that particular agreement, which was under the Libyan Political Dialogue Forum, uh, with the mandate that there will be election, national elections uh, in uh, December, which did not happen. We talked about it. Uh, the significance of that election uh, uh, is quite obvious. Uh, it is considered that this will be, this will address the uh, uh, kind of the uh, uh, power uh, vacuum in, in Libya. It will provide a legitimate government uh, uh, which will have the support of all different uh, uh, factions and all different warring groups in Libya. That is the expectation with which the elections were proposed. Uh, but since there is a disagreement over right. the, uh, 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 the nature of the electoral law the, uh, and other things, uh, that dis election is delayed. So, you know, the one quick question I think we have time for, you know, under the transitional government, they're saying that there's a chance actually of uh, the UN uh, envoy has said there's a chance of the country dividing into two. Could you talk about that? Uh, in uh, well, uh, interesting development happened in March uh, this year. Uh, after the the Beba government failed, the interim government failed to conduct the elections. The parliament, based in Tobruk, claimed that this government has lost its mandate because it was primarily made to uh, organize the elections. And it, since it has failed, therefore, this government should resign and a new government should be established. New interim government should be established. Uh, the Beba uh, refused to resign. 
and uh, and that that led to the parliament elect uh, passing a no confidence motion against the beba and electing a new government uh, uh, with fatahi bashaga as the prime minister uh, since his election by the parliament uh, both the uh, 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 governments uh, there are two prime ministers now in libya are trying to take control over they tried to take control over capital tripoli and which led to different clashes from time to time uh, leading to death of uh, dozens of people uh, in uh, earlier this year uh, finally uh, fati bashaga decided that he will no more try to come to tripoli and rule from sort okay one of the eastern uh, capital so there are two governments in libya right now one is ruled by fati bashaga in sort and one is ruled by uh, the beba based in uh, tripoli so uh, if the elections do not happen and this continues for longer the un uh, 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 envoy to libya uh, has a uh, fear that this will consolidate the power bases and this may lead to a, a formal split in the country all right abdul thanks a lot for joining us and that's all we have for you today thank you for watching daily debrief do come back to us tomorrow for more such stories visit our website peoplesdispatch.org and you can look up our regular updates on facebook twitter and instagram